Okay. Welcome back and welcome to some new faces. Uh, can I just have a show of hands? Who was here last week? Okay, so the majority, which is great. For those of you that are here now, uh, that are here for the first time, welcome to join us. Thank you. Um, last time I did a big introduction. I won't do it this time. You will get to know me as we're going. <laughs> um, but my name is Marcus, Marcus Neustetter, and I am an artist who's going to take you on a little journey over seven lectures or a series of seven lectures that talk about making process, reflecting on my experience over the last 25 years of making work in various spaces, in various ways. As you can hear, I speak English. For those that have joined this time, if I speak too fast or unclear, or if there's a question, just let me know. It's no problem at all. I can rephrase, I can slow down, or you can have someone translate it for you next to you if there's a problem. But um, unfortunately, I don't speak the dominant language in the room, which is always a challenge. Um, I speak in mark making, I speak in image. And so I've prepared a lot of slides. Those that were part of this, uh, um, I was gonna say the show. <laughs> Those were part of the show last time. <laughs> You'll see there's lots of images. The intention is for you to get impressions. And then from those impressions, we start formulating ideas and discussions, um, which I plan to do an hour talk and then have a half an hour or an hour, depending on how much time you have to discuss afterwards. And if you wanna have one-on-one -on -one discussions afterwards, I'm always happy to do that. As some of you noticed last time, um, we can just come to the front and we can chat. But, um, like with every lecture, I will start to introduce what we're talking about today um, without telling you any of the keywords or why I'm calling it this, but rather allowing the examples and the projects to explain it. It hasn't changed once again. There we go. Um, so, in the last session or in the last lecture, we spoke very much about this. Intention in this process of play and experimentation as being a key part of how we engage in the world. And so for the session now, um, my intention and my interest is to look at how we engage in this play and dialogue in public and private spaces. And why I'm saying this is because as an artist, I think it's very important that we as human beings acknowledge other human beings that are around us. And very often that doesn't happen in our private spaces, it happens in the public spaces. So I'm very excited to, to show you some examples of engagement and participation and dialogue in those public spaces. But, okay. so things last time. All right. um, but last week uh, we did something quite fun. So for those of you that have just arrived, we're going to do it again, just for the same sake of getting to warm up because I need a warm up, I need to connect with you somehow. Um, last week you made a sound. So what I'm asking everyone to do, and I'm going to do it again, is if we close our eyes and you take me to a place that is your space, that is your place in Ustina Durban, that is important to you, that has got a meaning for you, that challenges you or that you love, I don't care which one of those, and I want you to close your eyes and make that sound. So we're going to do it for just one minute. You create a sound from any way that's, that's, that is important to you. And you just repeat that sound. So let's start. Close your eyes and take us to a place that's important to you and start making the sound. Whatever sound comes to you, what are you hearing in the space that you're in? Add to the sound that you're hearing right now. Carry on. Now you've had an introduction of the sounds from last week. Let's add to it. I want to create a, an environment that we're in. Bring in your sound. Make a noise. 
Give us something that strikes you. Is it the wind that's blowing? Is it the dog that's barking? Is it the hooter of the car going kru kru? Is it something that's hitting the table? Is it um, a tree that's going in the wind? Come on, I want to hear it. It's too soft. Let's be in public space. All of our eyes are closed. Thank you. I love the laughter. Yes, we can laugh together. It's all good. So this is just a way to loosen up. Now that you've made it a fool of yourself, now we're all feeling better. This is the same thing we did last week, and we're going to do it again next week, so get used to it. But what we're going to do differently today is now that we've made the sound, what I want you to do, you've each got a piece of paper in front of you. Yeah? Roughly, don't fold it in half, but just make a little mark on the front and the end of the paper, so you kind of know where the middle is. You know what I mean? Just so you roughly know where, where the middle is. And what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to play the sound that you just heard and the sound that's in your mind again. And while I'm playing that sound, I would like you to start your pen on the one side as if it's off the page. Doesn't matter, whichever you prefer. And Draw me a landscape, a graph, a, a voyage, a journey, a, anything that comes to mind in the route that you might have taken to get here from home, in a cityscape, which could be, you know, the, the building, the nature, whatever it is, and draw me a soundscape across your page from the beginning to the end. So go, come off the other side. But I want you to do this not by drawing a perfect house or anything like that, draw the feeling of what it means to come and walk through your city, through your favorite space, from the beginning to the end. So all I want you to do is listen to the sounds. If you want to close your eyes to do your drawing, that's also good. Just be careful you don't carry on drawing on your computer and on the furniture. But um, maybe that's even better if you close your eyes. To create a purely audible expression of that and what's in your mind. It's going to be a very simple scape. Call it a soundscape, call it a landscape, call it a cityscape, call it an imaginary scape. And it could be about how you wake up in the morning and you go down some stairs and then you go in the car or you're going in the tram and then you go around a traffic circle and then you come to the school and then you're here. It could be as simple as that. Or it could be, this is what the skyline is that I see. Oh, there's a tree, there's a dog that's barking at me, there's a something else, and then that becomes your drawing. It can be as abstract as this. There's no right, there's no wrong. You're in a studio, it's okay. All right, so I'm gonna do this as a little experiment. Let's try and do this for about a minute or so. So I'm not giving you a lot of time to sketch detail. I just want to get an impression. Let go, be free. I know we're not all artists. We sometimes are thinkers and we're in a book or we're in our heads or we're researching. Right now I want you to let go and just draw the line, write the line, play the line whatever you want. So I'm going to play the sound again. gotten to the end? <laughs> Not really. It's fine. Take your time. <laughs> yes, I like the laughter. Good. <laughs> Look at the person next to you and laugh at theirs and let them laugh at yours. It's all good. So, so what I want you to try and do now, if it's possible at all, can I ask you to hold them up so we can see them, but join to the person next to you if you can. 
So let's see what happens if we, we, we start making one long, long landscape. One long scape. Okay, I'm gonna, yeah, there we go. Let's, let's, let's have a look at these. Can you, can you come closer with yours? Ah, look at that, amazing. All right, let's see how we can join them wherever you can. So there's one, one group over here. There's another big group over there. And just keep them up so we can see them. I mean, we're gonna, this is uh, quite abstract and lovely. <laughs> and what about you four? And now show each other. I mean, look, look. Uh, I mean, it's, it's quite amazing when you, they sit next to each other. <laughs> there we go. Okay, fantastic. Thank you. And so for the very last thing, what I want you to do is take your finger, go across the piece of paper with your finger, and tell me two or three words, in very simple words, of what's important to you about the drawing that you've just made. What is it that is in the, in the drawing that, that evokes something in you? Just think about it for a second. Look at your drawing. It could be something completely new. It could be something that you haven't seen before in your drawing that is now suddenly there. Just something that you feel is a, something in public space or is a reality in public space or is a, a question that you have that you would like to make sense of, something that's important to you, any emotion or even just the sound if you want to make the sound. So put your finger down over on the one side and make your way through it. Crossing the road is frustrating. I'm scared of the dog. Hope. War. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> okay, and make your way across the piece of paper. So we're going to go nice and slowly, and I'm just going to hear what you have to say, all at the same time. Just say the words. You can say it in whichever language you like. Go for it. Great, thank you. So even if you didn't say it, I hope you were thinking it. You were wondering, what can I say? What is the right thing to say? What is the wrong thing to say? What do I feel? What don't I feel? Whatever you thought or you said, keep it, hold on to it, and let's see where it comes to next week when we, or next time when we have another session. Maybe we'll use some of those words to explore. So this is just, as I said, loosening up. If you don't mind, for those of you that don't want to keep your drawings, I'd love to take the drawings afterwards and make a portrait of all of you just by a line, which uh, if, if I'm allowed to keep your drawings, I would love that. Um, for those that want to take them home because they love them so much, you're allowed to take them home. If you want to add some words now while we're making notes during the talk, you can also do that and use that piece of paper as your notes if you want. Up to you. Anyway, so talking about notes. Um, as I said last time, I like to share my notes by mistake, and now I'm doing it intentionally. Um, I think what I, why I did this little introduction in terms of collective un uneasiness, vulnerability, complexity in the room that I like to do is because it shows why we make art in the first place. I choose a route of the least, oh, of the most resistance almost, because I feel it provokes us in making something new. If we were to just do what we know anyway, we would sit behind our laptops or behind our books or behind our notepads and we'd listening to the lecture and go, okay, let's take a note just to be clever. 
Yeah, instead, what I'm hoping is that you now feel uneasy, you feel uncomfortable, you feel curious, but at the same time, maybe even a bit frustrated, not knowing where do I fit in this agenda of the artist who's standing in front telling me something. And I think this is quite an important way of engagement and connecting. So it's not always a successful one. It no, doesn't, doesn't always mean that everyone is part of it, but it's not about that. It's about planting a little seed in, one's, in the other person's mind to say, how do we engage and have a dialogue, even if it's one side talking and the other one feeling uncomfortable? Let us encourage that discomfort. And so I, I've chosen four examples of works that take me through pers a personal journey of what is the role of the process today? Why do we make art and how, do, how is public and private a, a space? What are the different forms of engagement? How can we connect? How can we engage? Acknowledging that it's personal. It's always personal. There's not something that's called non-personal art, in my opinion. The moment you put one piece of mark onto a piece of paper, one voice that you utter, one stump that you make, you're really making a statement. You're making something that's present. And you are the subject of that. So it always becomes a personal uh, acknowledgement. And that is, for me, always an acknowledgement of a search. You know, we produce work in order to search for something else. We produce work because we don't have the answer, but even if we think we have the answer and we make art about it, we discover there's a question in this part of it. And in that, and that's the last thing that's, that's, that's on my notes, is this idea of being vulnerable together. We connect to other, be others because we have a common vulnerability. We have a con common uncertainty. And there's a lot of philosophy written about this, which I've, we, we can get into later, um, which is quite an exciting search for how throughout time, even within Plato and Plato's cave, for example, there's this question of the not knowing and the vulnerable that is so important in, the, in, in trying to find out what makes the shadow or what creates another world or what creates the statement that's around us. And it's by being in a community and surrounded by others that we acknowledge that vulnerability. So I'll take you through a few examples now of, of works and then hopefully it will illustrate a little bit some of these points. In about 2006, um, this project was born called Hillbrow Dakar Hillbrow. Last week I gave an introduction to what Johannesburg is about. I'm not going to do it again. For those of you that weren't here, I'll just summarize that Johannesburg is a complex place in South Africa, which is a melting pot of different cultures that have come together in a, a transforming city that is a radically um, altering state. It's a place that has gone through very difficult times that has really been challenged um, through its political history. Um, it's down there at the bottom tip of Africa. Um, and it's got a very complex political history and is therefore incredibly unstable when it comes to the, the diversity of people trying to make sense of each other. It's a little bit like a microcosm of the rest of the world, but for, for my collaborators, Stephen Hobbs and myself, two artists, it's an exciting space to work and to be in public space. So this particular project is about a dialogue between these two places, Johannesburg and Dakar, a, a, a city in West Africa, that is a very important uh, um, uh, port for slave trade that used to happen from there. But it, uh, you know, in today's time, being a French colony is also a very complex, like South Africa, a place that was colonized, a place that was occupied, a place that, for, uh, that, that, that challenged human rights, and a place that's finding a new voice. So Stephen and I were working on some public artworks in the inner city of Johannesburg. In the heart of Johannesburg, we were walking around, taking, taking photographs. Look, I saw that hair. Anyway, <laughs> we were taking photographs of um, what the inner city was looking like. And we were documenting this journey. And as we're walking around, as two white South Africans in a very complex uh, space, we were being treated as tourists in our own city. I'm born in a hospital which is just behind this building here. And I live just about a block that way. And I'm walking through the city, and I get treated as a tourist by a Senegalese immigrant who speaks to me in French. And he says in French to me, this is a dangerous neighborhood. Be careful of your cameras. And I think, wait, I'm local. I'm from here. I'm not a tourist. You're the tourist. You've come from another country into here. I'm born here. But you speak French to me. French is not one of our languages. We've got 11 official languages, and French is not one of them. So you are definitely the tourist and not me. And yet you're warning me about my city and my context. 
And for me, there was an incredible shift in my brain around who am I in my own public space? Am I always a tourist? Am I always a visitor in the own public space that I enter because of the perceptions of who I am in this environment? It's no difference to any other public space around. But for us, it was interesting because um, walking around these public areas, we very quickly realized that you know, the, the perception that we all have of public space and of the space that we as artists want to occupy is that we are always the other. And I think there's a really important acknowledgement if you consider yourself as being different in a space that you want to do something in. So by chance, we were invited to do a project for the Dhaka off program for the Dhaka Biennale. So we were invited and they said, come and do a project in Dhaka, in Senegal. So all the way up there. I've never been there. I'd never, I have no idea what Senegal is like. So, so Stephen and I said, okay, let's use this moment where we were being treated as tourists in our own city and let's see if we can connect to the people that live and work in Johannesburg that are immigrants. Now, as you will know, a lot of, I mean, especially in today's time with, with, the, with the major movement of people through one cities via the uh, immigration, the refugees, etc., et cetera, where one is constantly confronted with people's stories. And so the, the magic that happened in the moment of trying to search for the immigrant community from Senegal in Johannesburg was that we ended up finding them. They were French-speaking community living underground in Johannesburg that was scared of anything that was from South Africa because of xenophobia. They were worried that the police were going to deport them. They were very careful of who to talk to. And through a contact um, into the community, we got to meet a whole bunch of, of them um, and have conversations about what it means to live in our city as immigrants that are afraid of the reality of what it means to be immigrants in the city. I'm pretty sure that if you dig a little bit in any urban environment, you will find that community that is uncomfortable with your own identity and who you are in relation to where they are and where they could be. And so this group of uncertain, unhappy um, Senegalese immigrants looked at us very skeptically. They thought we were police first, and then they, they heard we were artists, and they said, you're very strange. Why are you here? And we said, can you draw us maps, a little bit like you did today? Can you draw us maps of Dakar? We would like to go to Senegal. We want to go to Dakar, and we would like you to show us where to go. Show us the route that we should take in your city. And they started drawing their maps, um, very abstract maps. This is to give us an indication of where to go in Dakar. Um, a lot of them were completely uh, abstract with people that we should go meet with numbers, but then some beautiful drawings like this that said, you know, when you come into the car, turn a right at the traffic circle and then left, and then you'll find my old house, for example. And so we used those maps. And this, this person even showed us how to get to Dakar. So this person even drew the map of Africa and said, we are here, that's where you have to go. So we, we had these beautiful drawings that were given to us by the immigrants. And they said... Um, Go there and uh, follow our drawings. So that's what we did. Our project was basically flying to Dakar and navigating a city we don't know purely based on drawings made by immigrants in our own, own city. So it was a complete chaos. We got horribly lost. We, the only place we started off in is this, this, the host of ours, which is this uh, small art center called Kertia Sun, where we landed and we had a base. And then we looked at these maps and said, where do we go? We didn't use Google Maps. We didn't use any tourist guides. We only started to explore the city based on the drawings that we had. So the obvious first thing is because we couldn't understand what these drawings meant, we climbed the highest building we could find. And when we got to the top, we looked and we saw the city in the distance or the city center. It's coming. And we said, okay, well, let's walk towards the city center and see if we can make sense of the maps. And we started to walk and walk and walk. And uh, I don't know how many days later, <laughs> we finally made sense of the city. But um, you can imagine when you get told that there's a traffic circle and there are at least 15 traffic circles that you cross when you're walking, you, you make no sense of it. You get horribly lost. And that was the beauty of the project. We got to know people by getting lost. We walked around to people and asking them, can you show me where to go? Can you help me read this map? Which traffic circle is this? And then the interactions started to happen. And the interactions were fascinating because they were on the one scale with the city and with the map, and on the other scale with people that were trying to read the map with us. And very soon we realized that these maps made no sense anymore. 
a lot of these immigrants hadn't been home for about 10 years. So their maps and their memories of a place were completely abstract. But one of the maps which was really exciting, I'll just share one of many stories with you, was of Gore Island. It's an island just off of um, Dakar. It's an island that was used as a fortress, but also as a slave trade spot. And this map was drawn for us. And inside the map, there's a thing called a garden. And we were told that Richard, the gardener, is watering the garden. Ten years ago, he was there, and he was busy watering the garden every day. We should go and meet Richard and give Richard a message from Ali, because Ali used to be good friends with Richard, but he left for South Africa, and he's lost contact. But please, can you pass on a message from Ali? We thought, yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's go and meet Richard, the gardener. And believe it or not, we met him. So we arrive in Gore Island. We navigate the, the, the map that was given to us. And we find the garden, and there is a guy, a Rastafarian guy, I'm watering. And we were told he's a Rastafarian. And he's watering. And so I go up to this man and I say, uh, Pardon, to Richard. I mean, my French is very bad. And he's like, Oh, yeah, oui, oui, Richard, Richard. And so we start communicating with each other. And next thing, I tell him or I expre explain to him who Ali is and that if he remembers Ali. And there was a strange story about Ali smoked some weed and fell out of a tree. And I should tell Richard that because then he'll remember who Ali is. And Richard couldn't believe that he actually knew the story. And then the connection was made with Richard about Ali and his story. And he then gave us something to take back to, to Ali in, in South Africa. And so this very abstract relationship just became something which became a, a different way of mapping, understanding a city. And so for us, we got to know Dakar in a completely different way. And we presented this journey back to people in this art center. But the magic of the project, the most important part of the whole project, was coming back to Johannesburg. It was coming back to what, what at the time was a nightclub where we, we, we rented the part in the nightclub and we put a little projector up and we presented our journey, the pictures we took during our walks in Dakar back to the immigrant community to say, look, this is what you, your maps made us see. Because of your maps, this is where we went. And if I tell you the emotions were so high in this room, the Senegalese immigrants were partially, some of them were crying. I mean, grown men were crying to say, I can't believe I'm seeing my own hometown, which I haven't been to for so many years, and I can't go back to it. I don't have the money, or I'll get deported if I try and go because people will know I'm, I'm illegal, or whatever reason, I can't go back. But here there's a gesture of good faith, a, a gesture of exchange, a gest gesture of, of an image that is actually creating a relationship with me. And because of that relationship, I can now walk through the center of a very complex and dangerous part of the city. And I've got more friends around me that are Senegalese than there are <laughs> from, from South Africa. It's, it becomes a way of creating a connection and a bond with someone that, that was unexpected. And then many years later, when, when we did an exhibition about this project in Johannesburg, um, we were invited to exhibit in a museum, which is always strange to exhibit a project like this in a museum, and we can talk about the reason for that, is on the one hand, we had the museum exhibition and all the Senegalese immigrants came to celebrate with us. But the big thing is we did exactly the same thing. We climbed onto the top of the gallery, onto the, on the museum, on the rooftop of the museum, looked at where Johannesburg is, and then decided to walk with the Senegalese immigrants into this very complex city, which is in many cases a danger zone for, for many to go. You know, a lot of the inner city parts are, are very dangerous spaces. But these museum visitors ended up walking with us into the nightclub where we presented the story. And what was fascinating is that we reconstructed and redesigned the city map based on exchange, based on image exchange, based on uncertainty, based on not sure where we're going to walk, and based on a hand-drawn map. And so here we, as an example, we have a moment of interaction between cultures, between different identities, between different contexts that are about remapping and re-understanding who I as an artist am in my own city. And to be honest, that relationship to my own city has completely changed because of this interaction with the immigrant community simply by asking them to draw me a map of their own town. And so coming back to this question of being vulnerable in public space, in a city like Johannesburg, your vulnerability is permanent. You walk into the city and there's a sense of crime, there's a sense of difficulty, there's a sense of struggle, there's a sense of fight. And very quickly, by gestures like this, you start getting to know your city and your community in a completely new way and a new connection. And so as an artist, I feel that this part of it, 
was the least successful because unfortunately the museum wanted to know the story and want to see three-dimensional representation of it. And in retrospect, thinking about it, I was thinking of not including these slides because I thought, this is not what I want to take away from the project. It is that moment of interaction. It's that moment of reflection. It's that moment of being vulnerable together in a space that actually makes for a completely new dynamic relationship in, in terms of our uh, urban contexts. And so it's, for me, it's this idea of being private in public. We are able to share something that's very dear to us, that's very personal to us, in a space, in a public space, and by just acknowledging through the tools of a map, through the tools of, of something else, that we have a, a, a common ground, that we have a space to, to share. And so based on that, I, I'm in, going to introduce the next project called Into the Light. Now, this is about collective practice, like all of you did something together. I guarantee you, if this was a dark room and we didn't see each other properly and I asked you to make the same noises, you would have been very different. You would have behaved differently. There's something about being anonymous in these spaces. There's something about not being in the spotlight. There's something about not knowing the person next to you that well and either being able to be okay with making a fool of yourself or knowing them so well that you feel you can cry together and be happy together. So it's about how do we share these intimate moments? And this has been a search of mine I've done for a long, long time. And the way that I started to search for it, um, uh, I'm just going to show you, I'm going to skip through this, is I'm, again, uh, it's a bit dark today. Um, anyway, in the, um, it's a very dark video, I can see. Anyway, in the inner city of Johannesburg, there's such a transformation of the city There's such a transformation of the city that's happening that some of the warehouses where they're busy building, the, the, the workers that are migrant workers, that are immigrants living in the construction site that they're in. And so I walked one night past the construction site and I saw these people living inside the construction site. And I asked the question, I said, why you know, do you live here? And they're like, yes, we live here. This is our home. And they all had these handmade little lights in and amongst the rubble and in and amongst the the, the, the tools and the trucks and everything else. And I thought there's something quite strange about this, the scene of exposing um, this construction site. And so I asked uh, some of the migrant workers that I work with quite a lot to construct a moment within, within this construction site where they're searching for something. And I'm not going to go into the detail of the work, but it was more about the magic that you can start seeing happening in this um, clips of this video where we're using basic lights to just start telling a story. And they were telling their story about the gold that they were looking for. So Johannesburg, like Usti, is built on mining. It's built on this idea that there's some raw material beneath our soil that is valuable. And so the whole city came from there. And today still people go to South Africa not to find real gold, but to find their opportunity. And so they were talking about finding something in the construction site that was their gold. And so we actually created this little video or this film about them searching and eventually finding something and their story, become, their story becoming about that, that journey. So I had this incredible moment with these construction workers making this film. And, and I thought they were quite happy to talk about the things that they don't want to talk about usually. They were quite happy in the dark with the lights to express their frustrations and their fears. And so using that concept and that experiment, we just see some stills here, um, I decided, what happens if we always turn off the light? What happens if we start talking about things in the dark? And it sparked a completely new engagement process. Suddenly we were vulnerable, but we were in a common space. And the other best part of it is, throw in one little light, and suddenly something happens. Throw in one little, one, one little glow, one little torch, and something completely magical happens. And so this experiment of playing in the dark with light became a really exciting one because it was about telling a story through the image and uh, th through, through an image that you capture with your long time exposure. So um, China is very present in South Africa. So ch little China towns are 
everywhere. You can buy cheap lights. So this was a very cheap project because I always went to Chinatown and I bought very cheap lights there, you know, with the little LEDs that you can switch on or the glow sticks that you can break. And so I, as an artist, need to go where the technology is cheap. So I go to Chinatown and I go shopping. And so I entered into different parts in South Africa trying to make tell stories with light. And why I'm showing you this as an example again around play and experimentation like we did last um, I did last time is that through the use of, for example, here, glow sticks, this is a, I don't know, 100,000 glow sticks, break, 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 sweep, sweep, sweep. Suddenly you're sweeping shapes, you're telling stories. Participants feel they are part of an experiment and they start to come together, people join. And suddenly it becomes a very large collective exercise. Laser pointers, you know, the pointers that you use to show where we are on the slides. Hand out 50 laser pointers to a group of community and say, let's draw together a picture on the wall. What are we going to draw? And suddenly you start realizing the interactive nature of these, these laser pointers just by having your camera and taking a long photograph and allowing people to tell their stories. I'm not going to tell each one of these stories, <laughs> but... <laughs> But uh, this is an example of a, of a story that was really moving. So this is a small town in the center of the country in the, in the desert. And there at the back, in the background, there's a museum, that building over there. And that museum tells the story of the pre-dinosaur footprints, footprints made in the earth many, many years ago. And then it tells the story of the white people arriving as colonials in South Africa. And then it talks about today, but it skips a whole community of people in this museum. It's still an old museum that hasn't been updated. And so we, I, I, I happen to be in that neighborhood for another exercise and I walk into the museum and I say, there's something missing here. There's a whole image of people missing here. Surely there are stories by the people that are here that we want to tell. So I was introduced to a community center and I walked to the community center and say, how do you want to be seen in the museum? Come with me into the museum and tell me your story. How do you want to be understood? And two of the young, younger kids said, we want to dance in the footprints of the dinosaurs because that's where we belong. We are the missing link between the dinosaurs and what we are today. And I thought, you know, these two youngsters told me the story and I thought, wow, that's magic. So let's dance in the footprints of the dinosaur. So we, I go to Chinatown. They've got these lights, you know, with the, with the batteries. And we start drawing the dinosaur footprints. It looks a little bit like that um, in, in the landscape. And then using... Um, other lights attached to their bodies. We literally danced, or they danced, a, a local dance called the real dance, which is a culturally a very specific dance. And more and more people started to join um, from their neighborhood. And so eventually we created a series of photographs. And this is what's now hanging in the museum. A photograph that I then printed up and donated to the museum as a gesture of trying to bridge a small gap. It's not to say this is going to change anyone's life in terms of a, a story, but it holds in it a missing link in that museum that someone wants to show. And that was two of these guys that are in dancing in the, in, in the dinosaur's footprints. So that's what this project was about. It was about telling stories with light, allowing this temporary medium. And we have all played with long time exposure photographs. There's nothing amazing about this. We can all do it. You know, every phone can do it. Every, everybody that's been in front of a flame with a, or a torch and done this with their cell phone while someone else taking a picture has done this. But it's about how can you have that tool become a tool of engagement? How can it start telling a story? People telling all kinds of stories about a certain tree that used to be in the neighborhood that was destroyed because of the plantation that was there and uh, farmers. In this case, it was a, an observatory or a, an, um, a big observatory that I'll talk about next week. Uh, that, that the community that's on the base of didn't know what it was. And so we said it's the place for the Big Bang. Of course I had heard of the Big Bang. Before our universe formed, there was a singularity which was infinitely small and infinitely dense. Now I'm going to climb to the top. And I'm going to take a photograph from the top. Of all of us being together. And then expanding out mm, with can't see it. And then as you get far enough from each other, you start spinning them around. So in summary, this journey was, how do we create a meaning of the Big Bang? What is the Big Bang? I asked the question. Everyone was looking at me. I don't know. Something about universe spinning. So I said, good, then let's create an image of the Big Bang. And so I was on the water tower photographing down. 
and I let everyone spin around and become their own galaxies, kind of moving around and interacting with each other and knocking into each other. And then at the end, I brought the photograph down and I presented the photograph of what this Big Bang was. And that's the image. That image of the Big Bang is their creation that they then all have on their cell phones to say, next time someone says, what's the Big Bang? They say, this is the Big Bang. I've created it myself. And so that, again, that tool for engagement, a very simple tool that, that didn't cost a lot, but has completely changed my life because the access I'm getting into people's stories, into their narratives, into what they want to reveal is, is incredible. And so if, as material for me to process afterwards and, and make sense of, um, I ended up doing this for, I don't know, eight years of my life. Going, every time I saw an opportunity of, of engagement and participation, I ended up seeing how we can draw, how we can play, using fire, using lights, using torches, um, uh, coming together of creating new creatures, intervening in the city. And so these activities, when you start looking at them together, you can start to understand um, how in, in, in the quantity of them, each one has got a very distinct and different intention. Each one's got a different story. Each neighborhood has got something that they want to share that is very sensitive to them. And so um, a lot of them are very political pieces. A lot of them talk about what, they were, pe what people were allowed to do, what they weren't allowed to do, homes that were destroyed. Uh, people wanted to redraw their homes. People wanted to um, build new monuments. So this is building a new monument to contrast, to contrast the pyramid, which was a monument. So they said, we need a new monument to the future. How do we do that? Let's make a temporary one. That's what we did. Um, and then there was obviously play. And play is so important. So this is, uh, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of glow sticks that are broken up and swept together after a big event. And I said, to, I just set up the camera and I said, please create your own journey, create your own story. Fly through space as a way of reflecting on what it means to interact with, with, with this. Experiment and explore. And so, yeah, you can see everyone used it for themselves in their own way. They're quite fun. Um, some were just struggling to cross, while others actually did something which was much more intentional. Uh, some ended up dancing. And so this, again, this tool was something that I, I then shared the little stop frame animations with people on little WhatsApp groups. Um, I'm just going to jump through it because there's quite a few, just to give you a sense. So if you're very critical about this body of work, is it? art for art's sake? Is it art that sits in a museum or in a gallery and says, this is what I am? No. It's an experiment of play and storytelling that isn't about writing down the story. It's not about trying to relay every little detail. It's about trying to create a, a, a gesture of making that helps us connect and engage. And what was very interesting for me in this whole journey is the very personal and deeply political and deeply painful stories that people were telling. Less so in this piece, but definitely in the other pieces, where people were really taking um, some kind of ownership of that. And uh, those stories were then published. So there was a whole range of stories that were published um, to tell stories of different communities. And I'm showing this because I was very proud that um, I've got a good relationship with the South African Post Office. And they, for the International Year of Light, created this sheet of postage stamps. So it's a stamp sheet that... Um, Behind each one, so on the other side, there's, a, there's the story that's being told. So it just summarizes the story of each one of the stamps. And so people now own these things. They take them with them. They, they have them as part of the story. And so while this is happening and the stories are being collected and the pictures are looking so cool and people have them on their phones, I've got a problem. And this is another little side part to the project. And that is you can tell stories, you can do all of that, but there's a consequence. And the consequence is that I ended up with a room probably the size of this area here, um, from the corner to here, full of junk. Old glow sticks, Chinese lights that were broken, batteries, you, you name it, P packaging. And so I thought, isn't it interesting, the cheap Chinatown material that enabled me to tell stories is the very problem that is causing new stories to be told about our, env our, env our environmental crisis. It's telling stories about immigrant communities created by the Chinese relationship to, to Southern Africa. The fact that we've got so many Chinese immigrants is a very counterpoint to the very project that I'm doing. 
And for me as an artist, I became critical because people were telling me in the workshops, they were saying, this is great, but what are you going to do with this thing when you're finished? I said, I'm going to keep it. So I kept, kept, I kept on ke keeping the stuff. And I realized the stories that people were telling me were about the future that they were uncertain about. This is something as an artist I probably would have never thought about, but it was the community engagement that told me um, their reflection. And so it was the places where I was getting all this stuff called More and More. I mean, such a nice name for a shop. More and More. <laughs> buy more because it's cheap um, became for me a very very complex space and so what did I do I ended up having a museum show again exactly the counterpoint to what I said before and why I'm bringing this in is because it's about how do we relay these stories on the one hand I showed the photographs and there's short very short stories next to each photograph just, just to say just to explain what the what the journey was not not too long just a, a gesture but what happened in the foreground is I took all of this raw material and I turned it into art objects. I said, how can I make art to send back to China? How can I recycle the material that is left over and, and keep the stories for us, but send back all the stuff that we use to make something out of? And so the translation of the object, for example, became about building the Great Wall of China out of the dead glow sticks. So these are all dead glow sticks that don't work anymore. We tied them together made a massive Great Wall of China, stood it up and it all collapsed, and we said, ha, huh, isn't that funny, the Great Wall of China. Playful things in the museum. We, we um, melted down the glow sticks. So this is with a group of uh, students from the University of Port Elizabeth. We did a project where we had, I think by that point it was about 400 glow sticks, all broken, and you know they're toxic if you, if you do stuff with them. It's not good stuff, it's bad stuff, it's evil, it shouldn't be in this world, and I can't believe I was using it as an artist. So I had to make good somehow. And so the process of making good was about saying, well, let me recycle them and let me make objects that I can sell back to China. So these are the lucky frogs that I found. Then we made a, um, a series of these dragons that went back into Chinatown to try and sell them back. And then we made these shark fins because one of the big problems we have is the, the shark population that's being radically uh, taken out because of the shark fin soup and the shark fin trade. And so we decided, well, let's send shark fins made out of Chinese crap back to China. So we became very provocative and very kind of uh, uh, challenging. And it came out of this engagement with, with, with a whole group of art, uh, um, artists and, and collaborators. And for example, these cabinets of curiosity, which are the objects that you can buy in Chinatown, at the beginning look like that. So they look like that in the beginning of the show. By the end of the show, they're all dead. And that's just kind of the sim symbolism of how temporary and, and and in between we are in terms of our process. And so I'm showing you this because I think that the engagement is not only with the audience, but it's with oneself and the byproducts that one creates. What is it that we create in creating our own identity in the dialogue with others? Once we go back into the studio, once we go back into the space of the private, you have to process this material. Yes, you can take a photograph and write a statement, but it's the processing of the material that generates new work. And I find that to be um, sometimes as valuable, if not more valuable, in looking back at the interaction with people and saying, well, what was it that came out of these containers? So these were all containers that had the glow sticks in them. So you buy them in tubes. And so, again, looking at a large flag of sorts by tying these tubes together and thinking about what happens. Um, what happens to our continent? What happens to our sense of identity, to our place? what happens to um, the way we map the world, uh, what happens to the old Chinese maps of, of, of the trade routes of China when you start weaving them out of glow sticks into these, into these very large um, statements. And just sitting and weaving and thinking about the process of translating this material and who, how many people have touched this glow stick to sweep through the city or to throw it into the air. What does it mean when the material is got such a history in it and what are the new maps that are created in the making and so these became evidence of a process that is translated into something new and um, I, one of the highlights of that was creating these little dolls and now culturally in South Africa you've got this tradition of dolls you've got it in many other countries too but um, a lot of them are fertility dolls the, the dolls that you would have used traditionally for for ritual and fertility and so we decided to make Chinese prosperity dolls, dolls to actually create prosper and money. And what better material to use than recycled materials out of the, out of the um, 
ac actions we did together. And so there was a group of us crafters, so it was people that were making handwork, uh, that built dolls, etc., that worked together to make a whole set of new concept of dolls, which we then introduced to the University of the Witwatersrand art collection. Um, so in the exhibits, you've got um, you know, these objects that are now part of the collection of African artifacts that already show a long tradition and history of beadwork and other things that come from China that are now infused with other artworks that have come from this, this new process of recycling material. So for me, what was amazing, starting with a sense of dancing in the footprints of the dinosaurs and creating an identity for oneself in a complex time by a community by telling the stories in the dark, to then having an artifact that sits in a museum amongst other artifacts by similar communities asking questions about their own identity is part of that journey of engagement. And whether it's the material made by the artists or the toys that are being played with in the dark, it's, it's the same thing. It's about creating a, a string of dialogue and exchange. And in this case, I think the, the question I have for myself and for you obviously is, when I'm making this work, where's the voice really gone? So has the voice disappeared into an object or is the object now purely something that I own and say, now we've made this, now it goes into the gallery, it goes into the museum and everything else that's behind it is lost. This whole journey of the image is gone and all we have is the object. And I think that becomes a very critical point to think about. Um, and in thinking about that, it's about acknowledging the story that sits behind the object. And the best way to do is actually to make stories that you can tell. So by making a film, for example, you, that's the logical way. Make a film, people can see the film, do an audio recording, they can listen to the voice, and then you can have the object and the film together. Great. I feel that there's, as an artist, I want to push myself a bit more, and, and I was very fortunate to work at a planetarium for a while, where the community that lived around the planetarium didn't have an understanding of what the planetarium was. They'd never been inside it because it was something that was not offered to them in the past. And so working with this community, I set up a provocation. I said, what if the world changes? What is the story you want to tell? And I got a fake David Attenborough to do this for me. The population of the world tripled. This explosion meant catastrophic loads of greenhouse gases entering the atmosphere and wreaking havoc on the ecosystem down below. Every human born needed a place to live, food to eat, a school to learn, and space and resources to develop. All of this was taken from the natural world. The Earth's conditions and environments changed far faster than most imagined possible. Irreversible damage to the natural world meant the collapse of societies and the man-made world as it was now. We have run out of time and are living the catastrophe. Armed with our technology, an enormous imagination and an unshakable habit to prospect and claim, we are settling into the new world. Set in the hereafter, we imagine what is not known we journey with ourselves and consider the state of the earth in art. So the provocation was very simple. We're looking into a future that is collapsed. I mean, this is like most sci-fi movies. And what happens if we then ask not your scientists, not your experts, but what happens if we ask the community around us, what is next? What is the new world that we've created? How do we avoid this? What do we do? How do we challenge it? How do we change it? And all the visuals that you saw, including these ones, which are just stills from that, were created by the community that we were working with 
on the dome itself. So you imagine you're looking at a planetarium show and you're looking up and you're seeing your own story, your own neighborhood, your own vision, your own experiment above you. And what that does to you when you start to do that. I mean, these were um, drawings and sketches and films that were then created with professional filmmakers that helped film it on a high definition 8K camera and everything like that. But it was made by the people themselves. So the whole planetarium show, which is usually an international um, uh, person like David Attenborough telling us about the stars, became about the people below. And so I took that quite to heart that, uh, that you know, replacing the object with an experience and actually telling the story. But you cannot do that without people present. So in the planetarium itself, while you had the big projection on the dome, down below, and also working with shadows, this is actually the same image reflected onto the, or similar, reflected onto the top. We had the performers working in the planetarium so that people sitting and looking up also had something happening below. And live performance was part of it. And there was this incredible relationship between the person on the ground and this planetarium dome to create the connection between the human and the films that we make. And this is quite important. Very quickly, looking at Netflix and all of these amazing documentary spaces that you get, we lose connections to the very people that are there. So we're happy to watch a war on TV all the time because there's no person standing next to you that said, I've suffered from that war. Um, you know, we're very quick to be mediated because of this, this abstract concept of what our vision for the future is because we love to speculate. But where's the bodily relationship to that? And that interaction with other artists and that dialogue and that exchange between... Um, building things together, making art together, creating installations together, um, having that dialogue meant that um, it opens up a new way of engagement. And it was a very successful planetarium show. I'm very proud of it because a lot of people were involved, as you can see, and it became a really strong um, performance series. But COVID came, like with so many things. There were supposed to be three planetarium shows and the big uh, final one in 2020, and that was cancelled. <sighs> So here I go back again. Now I was very proud of creating stories rather than creating objects because that's really what it's about. And suddenly my stories were taken away and I had to find a new way. And what we ended up doing is taking the same community, the same group and going into another space and that is Zoom. We've all been on Zoom. We've all been on Teams. We all have Google Hangout. And what we ended up doing is saying, what happens if we create the planetarium in everyone's home? And so for me, that was an important, critical moment in, our, in who we are as people today, is that we were able for the first time to be public and private at the same time. You know, maybe we were only private, I mean, public from here to here, while underneath we were still wearing our pajamas and above we were, we were wearing our suits. But that question of what's public and what's private became very interesting in the space. So imaginary futures became a experimental space that, no, yes, no, sorry, I'm trying to see if this video works, it became a, a, a very experimental space, It became a space that um, helped people through a lot of crises. It became a space where artists were working live on their screens. We know there were a lot of these projects around. But for me personally, it was keeping contact with these artists that were working on this planetarium show together before, that others that joined, that were actually some of them going through COVID, that vocalist that you heard singing, um, um, Manzikazi, she was really struggling because she had COVID and she was struggling to sing at some point. And so, but she would join us for every session and she would lie on her bed and like look at us through the thing just to be present. And she would whisper to us to say, I'm worried about losing my voice. I'm so scared. This is what, everything I've lived for is my voice and I'm losing it. And you know, here we are sitting watching this and we were all in lockdown. We were terrified of what's happening. We know this. We are all part of it. And yet the artists came together into these, using the provocation I said beforehand, you know, about this reinvention of a space, 
We didn't realize that the hereafter was so quick to come. We didn't realize that we were going to actually be in this apocalypse in a completely different notion so quickly when you're sitting in a small little home disconnected from the world around. And um, what became really exciting, just to show you a few more clips of this, is every artist found their own medium to live perform, to live participate, to shifting the camera into the medium that they were using and responding to different themes and concepts that were being spoken about. And then we did collective things where we all went into hiding. We all tried to do things at the same time. So the audience, the visitors that weren't artists that joined, were asked to participate. They were asked to turn off their lights in their own space. They were asked to disappear from the camera and reappear. They were asked to cover themselves. And so it became actually a very strange cathartic performance experience where, other than that woman down here, <laughs> everyone else had turned off the lights and, and, and actually immerse themselves in the experience. Now suddenly, as an artist, I've got access to your home. I'm suddenly turning off the lights in your house to create an atmosphere in your home that extends my ability to tell a story from a story to a planetarium show to someone's living room or someone's bedroom or someone's bathroom or wherever they are hiding at that point in time in the dark, playing with the light. And so this impact that we can have by allowing people to be vulnerable together in a space and have have anxiety together in a space and express something together in a space is very, very important. And um, what I did want to show you on, on, on this one here, just very, very briefly, and what was so amazing, no, not this one, the next one, pardon me. Um, uh, where is it? No, it's not in here. All right, doesn't matter. Um, there were moments, no, it's, it's not in there, it doesn't matter. There were moments, for example, where, where two artists ended up meeting but because they weren't allowed to talk to each other or touch each other, they actually performed through the window. And we've got in one moment uh, two cameras. The one put his phone on the inside and the other one, the woman put it on the outside and they were dancing on either side of a, of a window and, 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 and kind of capturing each other's movement from two views. And I mean, for me, it just exploded into a completely new understanding of how we can work collectively and tell stories. And for me, this, it just became a really exciting, and it continues now, way of connecting globally to artists around the world. And I welcome you, all of you, for the next Imaginary Futures to just join, because that's what it's about. So here, for example, we had Colombia and Senegal and Switzerland and South Africa and the DRC, all these different countries trying to connect to each other to, to talk about the power of the commons and doing a performance for that. Um, and then we did projects even during the lockdown, which were physical, where that same army of people went out and did one small public act as a way of connecting at the same time. And so I'm starting to understand for myself as an artist that there's a, a way of collective storytelling and shifting that is, that is much more exciting than I ever thought could be. It's not just about telling the single story, but about creating a collective consciousness and a collective story. And this is what I want to encourage in thinking about what I was saying earlier, that it's personal, that we are not a group, we're not a band where everyone's doing one thing and there's one voice. When we are a band, the drummer has as much emotion as the vocalist, has as much emotion as the sound engineer, funnily enough, that sits and makes sure that the band works. And there's something about the harmony of all of those things together that makes for a collective practice. And the only way that it can work if we all feel like we're actually contributing to that collectivity and to that public presence in a very personal way. And I'm going to end the session now with one last reflection, uh, uh, a very personal one, which is now post-pandemic. So I've showed you all of this stuff. Imaginary Futures carries on. It's becoming physical, as you see by this image. Suddenly, I've now got... Uh, um, this is Fatou Sisse from, uh, from Senegal. We're performing in Paris. And there she's on the screen. But then there were about six other screens that joined eventually. And myself, present in space. And now suddenly, we're getting another view where we're seeing the actual performer in the window, so something shifts in terms of what it means for performance. Um, but now, now suddenly I'm, I'm asking myself the question, what does it mean to be completely present in public and taking my studio into the public space in a completely new way? So there's a wall in Vienna, I now live in Vienna and I'm looking for meaning. And there's a wall in Vienna that um, I got permission to work on. And so I decided to find this right opposite the wall, this space that used to have a tree. That space is no longer there. The city has now covered this. But it was just this place where the tree used to be planted. And I decided, let me just sit there and think about what I'm going to do on this wall. And let me trace the absence 
of not being in South Africa, the absence of the person that I spoke about right in the beginning, the immigrant, who am, that's me, coming back in a full loop, the person that needs to draw the map for themselves. And let me think about what it means to draw that absence. Is it the tree that's no longer in that space where it was before? Is it, this is another part of the wall, is it a landscape like you were drawing earlier on? And what if I start to mold something out of the earth that's there? What if I start to build something out of the space um, and trying to make sense of the space? What if I splatter the wall with the material that's around me? And suddenly I realized I was inside my little studio. I was inside my little head for the whole day, from the morning till night. I just sat there and I started making and thinking. I didn't know what it was going to be in the end, but I knew it was going to be something that leaves a trace of my journey and my process. I was completely vulnerable. I was completely uncertain. I had people watch me. I had drunk people asking me for money. I had all kinds of things happen, but I was just making art and I felt there was a strange new world I was exploring as an artist in this idea of making art together. And I ended up celebrating things. So I don't know if you saw in the beginning, there was a weird plinth thing that I built into the wall that I decided I want to leave something behind. And I left behind that sculpture, very much like the prosperity dolls, that, that sculpture that comes from the earth, that is unknown in its dimensions, its material, and its, and its, um, and its date. It's something that we, we own as humans that is the uncertain. And for me, is the true product of that engagement and that participation. So on the one hand, it's about the work. It's about the final object that then is there, that holds so many different stories in it. But for me, it was a really cathartic and important experience to be in that public space from morning to night and actually be an artist in that space and really be private in the public environment because it shifted the way I saw myself, it shifted the dynamics between the relationship and conversation with others, and it made me the immigrant that was drawing the maps. You know, it made me the person that's trying to tell my story to others and, and guide them through something. And Essentially, this idea of engagement and participation is really, um, for me, a very critical path to say that we engage with ourselves. You know, as I said before, it's very personal and it's a constant search. And so I hope with this lecture I showed you a journey and a, and a process that picks up on key moments, key concepts that create hooks for connection between why as an artist I struggle between, and not I, many artists struggle between what's private and what's public why we play with collective practice. Um, yeah, and I, and I would like to open it up to any kind of questions and discussion around how you feel, how, now that you've been through this journey with me, how you might feel about your own drawings. <laughs> if there's anything that you picked up on that, that, that you could reflect on. And whether or not, and this is what I would like to leave you with specifically, whether or not as a creative producer, whether you're an architect, designer, artist, or whatever, you actually feel that you have enough of your own vulnerability in that public space, whether you share enough of your own personal journey in your exchange with others. And it doesn't always have to be public as in the square outside. It can just be in a one-on-one -on -one relationship with those that you're working with, with your audience, with your client, with your partner. Because I think that's really where the magic comes in the making process. And I've advocated for that forever. And now luckily with Imaginary Futures, there's a little army of people that are all doing that at the same time. And it's really exciting because they're creating incredible work. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to have you join any time. So I think I've just actually perfect timing. Are there any questions? Are there any comments? Are there any concerns? Have you had any experience in public space like this? Um, have you, do you feel vulnerability is a good thing? Do you hide away from it? Are you too shy? Are you angry with these ideas? Do you have issues with anything that I've said? I hope you do. You know, where, where are the... Where are the challenges? Where are the concerns? Where are the ideas? I had one or two conversations at the table last time um, that was were really exciting. So I understand maybe some of you don't want to speak openly but want to have one-on-one -on -one conversation. But yeah. Yeah. I find the idea of recycling the waste you collected throughout the project, the light project, but it's, but it's great. It's great that you basically put it on another level and <laughs> kind of poked somewhere. Um, me, for example, I didn't know that, um, let's say, China has such a unsavory background with Africa, but I feel 
I feel like Africa is a lot of, like a continent and countries within that gets exploited a lot from outward um, like places, not just Britain and Europe in general. Uh, but I didn't know that. I, I, I need to add to that just because of um, having done the research. The reality is also where other countries that have been exploiting are pulling away and saying, you know, this is part of the colonial past. We have to be careful how we identify. Very little investment is going back into the continent that is really changing the continent. And China is the only presence at the moment that is also investing back into the continent. So this also has to be seen in two ways. Unfortunately, I don't personally, this is a purely personal point, I don't see yet the value of China's investment as a builder of communities. I'm seeing at the moment the investment as being a partial exploitation for the future. It's a very slow process, a little bit like colonialism was very slow. It's a new kind of uh, colonial relationship, but it's not only bad because at the moment a lot of countries that are very hungry and very much in need are not being helped in other ways. The only people coming to help is the Chinese government. And so one also has to ask the critical question, how do they work together? Um, and we don't see enough evidence of how it works in a positive way. And the last point is I tried to send those recycled objects back to China. So I had a museum that was interested in hosting the exhibition there so that I could sell the objects back to China. That was the whole point. Ship, put it in a container, ship it back to China so they could deal with the trash afterwards as art. And um, the, the museum that was going to host the show realized that it was quite a critical work. So they already knew it before, but I think somehow they got worried about it. And because of the particular kind of uh, control mechanisms of the Chinese government, they decided to, to pull back. So I got a letter of, um, or an email to say, we apologize, but unfortunately, to the, due to the nature of this work, we cannot host it after all. And so for me, that was also, again, the critical question. Is self-criticality of the person coming into a country important? And I think it is. And if they can't accept the comment coming back, then we have a problem for the future. Because if you can't be critical of the people that are coming into your space um, in a constructive way, then you know, it's a breakdown of communication. So. It's great that this project reflected uh, the problem with plastic uh, wasting. But has the art uh, enough power to change the situation? That is, that is a very good question. I don't, not by itself. And not in one moment. It needs many small interventions to change. That's my opinion. So if you, if you create enough small moments repetitively, I th we think we had the question last time about going back into places to, to rework and create a relationship with a place to really change it. It's the repeat process that actually creates an impact and a change. Um, and and I, I fundamentally believe, otherwise I wouldn't be an artist. I believe that we can make a difference. I just f am critical of trying to become an artist or being an artist that only makes a difference within four walls. That's why I keep on advocating for public work, because we have to reach beyond. Yeah, I, yeah. I understand that the project is not the moment of the change, but it can be good impulse for the next and next project. Yeah. And it's uh, like a machine and it's going to uh, uh, be on moving, not just stop on that point. Yeah. One hopes. Yeah. But that's what one shares. That's why it's important to share the work. And, yeah. and I think it uh, can influence uh, the children, and children are growing up and reflect the situation more than without this. That's a very good point. I mean, my daughter, who's 11, at the time, a few years ago, said to me, Daddy, you make a lot of junk. I don't know if she meant how bad my art is, but I think she was referring to the material. <laughs> And I think that's right. It's, we create a consciousness by doing it. Um, yeah. Do, do, you, do you think, though, that um, the language that we use is addressed to, to those that are affected? So my big question for this project with the lights was everyone could join because it was an easy thing to do. So children were participating, adults were participating, people that aren't educated in art were participating. And it was important and good because of that for me. But very often I see public projects that are about engagement and they use the language of art that isn't always accessible. And so I'm asking, my question back is, what is the language we need to use in the world of design, in the world of architecture, in the world of art, in the world of music, 
are we only looking at the popularist things? I'm thinking of social media, what's popular? Or do we try and find new languages? That's kind of, I don't have, a, there's no answer to this, but it's a provocation. Uh, I can feel in this art language that's a good message that it's not necessary to have just environment, depression, and feel bad about it. And it can be fun to, uh, to do this uh, environment projects and uh, recycling topic can be fun for children. Uh, maybe it can inspire uh, next uh, festivals or, or these very big uh, mm, waste producers, or mm. I don't know how to say, sorry for my English. No, no, it uh, makes a lot of sense. Your English is great, except my Czech. I, I can imagine it. Do it after every techno party. In, exactly. To, for example, Tomorrowland. Make this big art project after this. <laughs> yes. We sure need to involve our communities in art more because I feel like problem of art of not just today but mostly of the past is that uh, it was a bit of a it was a little snobbish it was a little high class it was a little you know and that's the reason why people a lot of people don't visit galleries because they feel like you know that's not that's not for me that's too maybe high class for me or I'm not educated or, or cultured enough to understand it and like mm. art needs to step out especially in our in today's era of performance and uh, activism it needs to step out of galleries and uh, look for the people not the other way around mm -hmm. not not always of course it's not i'm not saying all art god no i just mm. like we can pick big the mona lisa from the louvre and like <laughs> walking around it through paris yeah it is to prove that Art can be all around us in everyday life, and we can create from and we can from commu everything. communicate through it, and like you know, learn and connect with other people. And it's great. It's not about art too. Actually, there are a lot of great artists that work outside. They try to connect with people, but we need to count on that not all people are. Yeah, not everyone. They they don't they don't want to learn. Mm, yeah, they are not you open. are lazy to understand. That's definitely and, and the case. It ain't, you don't need to study it. And you just say, you know, they just say, I don't understand it, and they just push it out uh, from the front table. I think a lot of it comes from know. fear. A lot of it comes from fear of like embarrassing themselves, perhaps. They, well, or I they think, just don't care. I think or, on the other hand, you got these social gaps that the people mm, struggle mm. a lot with uh, different stuff and uh, art yeah. from them is something like you then can and never, never reach or yeah so mm. it really depends but in the terms of uh, some political change i think from my point of view uh, the art itself is really weak and uh, i think it's some uh, uh, tool to uh, engage people but uh, if you want to make some difference with uh, in terms of environmental stuff uh, you need to go to politic or to be activist mm -hmm. uh, art can can change anything i think yeah. you need to go to uh, china, china parliament or uh, usa government and uh, that, that will make a difference art mm -hmm. is uh, kind of uh, di different word than, than politics. It's, it's not just about China. It's uh, too many countries uh, which are uh, the part of this problem, and yeah, definitely. it's for many, many years. Mm. I think centuries, and uh, it's more comfortable and easy close eyes and uh, just survive in it. Mm. Yeah, for sure, but. Yeah. Um, I like like uh, public art. I'm really a fan of it. But I think it's uh, now we are in uh, this uh, close hermetic uh, faculty space, you know, mm -hmm. with uh, really uh, I don't want to touch anybody, but uh, like a white uh, privilege, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. heterosexual, blah blah blah. So uh, that's kind of a perspective we need to look when we are like. Yeah. trying to have questions what to do with art. 
So is it the, um, on the one hand, yes, I could become a politician. Um, on the other hand, no, the politicians, like so many other disciplines, have got their own problems. Um, you know, kind of, and essentially my passion and my interest is in understanding the world from a different perspective and trying to articulate that. And I'm, I'm saying me, I'm referring to us, otherwise we wouldn't be studying the medium that we're studying. Um, so, while there might be audiences that don't take, take it or can't take it because you're being critical of them or because they're lazy or because they're from a different condition, the survival. Thank you very much. I've got more than enough people that are trying to survive in the projects that are telling me, Marcus, stop making art and just feed me. You know, it's, it's literally that, talking about white privilege in South Africa, I don't even have to go there. The, the, the reality is that I have my tools kit. And I think at the end of the day, as an artist or someone that's studying it, we say, what, what's the best impact one can make? Because if other people were to take that same step in creating hope, and I made some notes here because I actually think there were some very nice things around, around um, this, the idea of not only stepping outside oneself, but actually allowing an audience to step outside itself. Allowing the person, whether it's art or just a kind gesture, to, to rethink the relationship to the space that they're in. And so I'm wondering whether, um, on this journey, I'm just reflecting because it's such an, I mean, this is about making. Yeah. Um, whether this revolution needs to happen that we don't take ourselves too seriously as artists but actually meet the audience in their lazy space like why can't we sit and have a beer while watching the soccer or football or whatever yeah, and, and express a moment of en engagement rather than trying to hide behind what we've learned at the institution to be the artistic practice that needs to happen. We can always make that on the side. We can always make objects because we like to make them. But uh, you know, that's where I'm, I'm trying to understand my next steps. Never mind everyone else's. But you know, is, is, that, is that me breaking down my own privilege and assumptions of that which I want everyone to learn so that I can carry on making what I make? I think that's a very complex concept. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't want it to be pessimistic. But no. uh, I think the art got some language and some... Uh, uh, I don't know how to say, uh, we, we can sharp our senses through it and we can sharp politics senses through it. Uh, yeah. So I think we got like these abilities, different kind of uh, rational and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, but I think uh, we cannot change the world only just by art. We can just put things to good points. So when we look back in time, if you look at art history, if you look at history generally and you, you see the big wars and you see the civilization shifts and all kinds of things, there are symbols and moments that represent those times that we look back now and we say, okay, well, this artwork represented the ethos of the time. Um, I like to fast forward and say what represents the ethos and the time that we're in now through which work? through which engagement, through which platform. I seriously hope it's not social media. <laughs> but what is the thing that represents that which we are now? And what is the language and the voice that comes out of it? Because I do think that's the artist's role. So to, it's not to counter it, but to, to add to it, I think it's that, yes, we search for our place in every... I mean, the Surrealists came from somewhere, you know, and then they were the Surrealists, and everyone now goes, well, at the time, that was revolutionary. Um, well, you know, now we could think it's maybe not that revolutionary. But you know, within our context, that confusion that we're in right now, we were saying, what impact do we really have? I think is the very spirit of the time we're in. Um, and I hope the same goes for economies, for politics, for um, kind of uh, development projects, because I think we all need to have that critical question. So I'm liking this idea that... that um, we should all enroll for political classes so that we become more informed and then we abandon that too <laughs> because we realize it's got the same revolution that's required. Anyway, we're in a complex time. I think we all know this and, um, and that's just part of the nature of making art in complex times. Yeah. So I think we've had a lot of time spent, a lot of energy. Everyone's tired, a full day. 
There's another talk happening now at the House of Arts by some very interesting German artists. It's a German duo, right? I think they're from Germany. Anyway, uh, yeah, yeah, they, they're, yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, it starts at 6, oh, which is now. Okay, so we should go. <laughs> If you want to give them to me, then I'll scan them in and I'll make a portrait of you. <laughs> Unless you want to keep it, then you keep it. I'm quite happy to take them. I won't destroy them, I promise. Thank you.